So welcome to calculus. So last week we were in section 9.1 and we were drawing uh, functions and we had just drawn a function that looked more or less like this. That was the last thing that we did. Okay, <clears throat> so to continue that thought just a little bit and get into the next section. In Calculus 1, most of Calculus 1, and part of Calculus 2, we, had, we were dealing with functions of a single variable. And that single variable usually called x. So our conceptual model picture was something that looks like this maybe. So some interval a to b and then some nice looking f. <laughs> so here's a just a, a picture of a function defined on the interval a to b. What if, what if I select some point in the interval a to b, like this point, call it x naught, x zero. How do you, how do you, from the picture, how do you tell uh, the value of f of x naught? Sorry? Right, so you, you take this point, take it up to the function, and this height, that's f of x naught. Okay, and you can kind of imagine that this, that this was a moving diagram, and I could grab hold of this blue point and move it back and forth, and then you'd see it following uh, f. Okay, so this is, this was when we had a, a single variable. So now we have functions of, of multiple variables, and in particular the case we're going to focus on is two variables. So now the, the picture is a little more complicated. So again, let's, let's label the axes. So in the single variable case, uh, where we say um, the variable is x and the output is y, what is this axis? X. This is the x-axis, and this one the y. Okay, so suppose now that we have z is f of x and y. So which axis is the z-axis? The one pointing up. The one pointing up. Which one is x? The one coming out of the page. And then by process of elimination, that one is y. So the reason x is coming out of the page is because, uh, remember the right-hand rule, you, you put your hand on the x-axis and point your fingers in the same direction so my fingers are coming out of the page. And then twist your fingers to y through the acute angle, <laughs> like we said last time, and then thumb is pointing in the z direction. So x to y is z. x to y is z. Okay, so this is a right-handed system. If it was the other way around, if this was x, then you'd have to point your hand, you'd have to point your hand in the, in the x direction, okay? so that you could twist your fingers to, to the other direction, so to, 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 to the other one, and now my thumb is pointing down. So that wouldn't work. Okay, so x to y is z. So now, <clears throat> in the single variable case, functions were usually defined on an interval, something like this. Now they're going to be defined on a subset of the plane. 
So I'm going to draw some subset of the plane. It's going to look like a, a puddle, more or less. So f is defined on this puddle, on this puddle. And now I'll take this up. Draw some nice function here. Okay, and then this little bit is a piece of the surface that we can see from behind. So that's like the under, underneath of the surface. <clears throat> okay, so this is a surface you could, you could. If you were a little bitty, you could walk around on it. Or if it was like the size of a car, you could wax it like a car. <clears throat> so what if we select a point that is in the domain of f, say like this one? So in the single variable case, one number is enough. One number is enough to describe where you are. How many numbers are necessary to describe this one? Two, right? X, so we'll, I'll say X not, Y not. Okay, then just like from in the single variable case where we went up to the function, we'll do the same thing here. So I'll go up to the function and get that point. And this is that height right there is f evaluated at x naught, y naught. Okay. So any question about this? <clears throat> so this is sort of the conceptual model in the single variable case, the conceptual model in the two variable case. Okay. <clears throat> now in calculus, one, so another remark, in the single variable case, we were particularly interested in um, pieces of function that look like this one or this one. in the single variable case. So why were we particularly interested in, in these two kinds of things? OK. Finding the inflection points. So I'm fishing for an E word. Equation of life. Starts with E, ends with? Extrema? Oh, extrema. Ah, that's it. Extrema. <laughs> extrema. <laughs> oh, she, I just didn't hear it. Someone said it already. Okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> this one is a local maximum, and this one a local minimum. minimum. Okay. What do, what do both of these have in common? So, in a sense, they're sort of as opposite as they can be, a local max and a local min, but they actually have something in common. What do they have in common? It's not, it's not that. So, so there's, the, there's the local maximum. There's the local minimum. What do both of these have in common? What, what is true at this local maximum? Zero. It, well, what is zero? The derivative is zero. right? And what's the name, the analytic name, for a place where the derivative is zero? A stationary point. So stationary and stationary. And then what is the geometric name for a place where the derivative is zero? So the analytic name is stationary point. What's the geometric name? Tangent. Horizontal tangent, right? So horizontal tangent, horizontal tangent, or stationary point. OK. So we were particularly interested in these uh, these things in the single variable case. 
So in the, in the two variable case, <coughs> We're going to be particularly interested in uh, three separate situations, in fact. <clears throat> so one of them, like this. So here we're kind of looking into a, a bowl. Okay, so then <clears throat> at the bottom of this bowl is the is a minimum. Okay. We're also interested in the same thing except turned up turned over so it's a cap. And we're interested in the top of this cap. So, a maximum. <coughs> And we're actually going to be interested in, in one other kind of thing. So, <clears throat> so now, I have a question. So back in the, back in the day, right, thousands of years ago, our, our ancestors, uh, you know, were quite concerned with just the business of staying alive. And more or less to them, I, I imagine that probably all of them, to a person, thought that the earth was flat. Because when, when, when all that you're doing is trying to survive, okay, you don't have a lot of time to think about. <laughs> you know, whether or not the earth is flat is kind of philosophical when you're running from a lion or, chase, or chasing a gazelle, right? Okay, nevertheless, it, it's quite reasonable, actually. And you, you can put really no blame on them for thinking the earth is flat. Because after all, it does look that way. If you're, when, you're as, when you're this human size in comparison to earth size. It does look flat. <clears throat> so, locally, anyway, it appears that, that the earth appears to be flat like a plane. So, in the single variable case, this is a horizontal tangent line at a maximum and also a horizontal tangent line at a minimum. What's going to be true here and here? A horizontal tangent plane. plane. We're gonna have horizontal tangent plane here, horizontal tangent plane here. So a horizontal tangent plane, a horizontal tangent plane, and it may strain your imagination, but there's actually uh, another kind of surface that can have a horizontal tangent plane. Does anyone know its name? Anyone? Some, some person who was just <laughs> over, the, over the weekend <laughs> flipping through the calculus book. <laughs> Well, an instructor can dream. Okay. <laughs> so, so here we go. So, so this is a Pringle. I like it. A Pringle. Okay, it's not usually called a Pringle. <laughs> uh, in fact, it's usually called a saddle. A saddle. Okay, so at this point right here is a horizontal tangent plane. So what I want you to imagine, okay, is imagine that this, that the Earth's surface was actually like this. It was actually like this. Or let's not imagine that for a minute. Let's imagine uh, that this really is a horse, a horse's saddle. I'll put a little face here to help you do that. Okay, the, the, horse's, <laughs> the horse's spine has positive curvature, like this, positive concavity, and then your legs go over the saddle like this, that's negative concavity. Okay, uh, <clears throat> alternatively, if you don't like the horse analogy, 
then uh, you can imagine that this is a mountain pass. So you're, you're walking up a mountain and you're going in between two peaks. So there's a peak off to your left and a peak off to your right. Okay, now imagine that, that this was the surface of the earth and now, now make yourself uh, very, very small in comparison to this surface. If you just looked locally, then it would still appear flat. It would still appear to be a horizontal tangent plane there, except it would look like something like this. So it would go in. Something like this. Okay, so this one is called a, a local min, a local max, and a saddle. So today, today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about these. We're going to build up the necessary uh, technical details to talk about these three things. Okay, so that's just by way of foreshadowing. So any question before we get to that business? This one? Well, I, I have a hard time drawing it, so I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll draw a bigger one. <clears throat> so what's happening is that there's grid lines going like this. And right here, so th these would be visible back here. <clears throat> so that's the back. Right here at the top. Here at this point, imagine yourself walking, walking up a mountain between, in, in between two, in between two um, mountain peaks. If you continue along the red if you continue along the red trajectory, then you could not walk any further that way and go uphill anymore. And if you were to, con to go along the green trajectory, you could not walk from here and continue and go downhill anymore. So in the green direction, you can get no lower. In the red direction, you can get no higher. Does that answer it? Yes and no? OK. <clears throat> OK. Actually, is she ask, are you asking the plane that intersects into the cell? I think I'll that. If we just continue, OK. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So this brings us to section 9.2, which is called partial derivatives. Okay, so definition. Suppose that we are given some function f of x and y. Okay, so I'm going to draw a puddle. <laughs> so it's defined there. <clears throat> and now I'll draw a surface.
So I'm noticing that I'm not drawing your puddles very well. Okay. Is that gonna hurt me on the test, on the quiz? Not really, no. I'm just, I'm just making it up every time I do it. Okay. <clears throat> So here's, here's a, uh, a function, uh, its surface. So now let's select our favorite point in the domain. So how about, say, this point here? Okay, now there's, there's the point on the surface, and what we're going to do is we're going to imagine that we're going to hold y fixed and only travel in the x direction. Okay, so then we're not allowed to travel left and right. We're only allowed to travel in and out of the page. And the way we're going to make that work conceptually is that we're going to take a plane. So this is the xz plane right here. We're going to take a plane parallel to the xz plane and we're going to cut it through this blue point. So we're going to take this plane and sort of cut it like cutting a loaf of bread. So right along that plane. So if we do that, then this puddle would be cut parallel to the x-axis. So this, this is parallel to that. Okay, and you would observe. So something like this. <clears throat> so we've, if you take my meaning, we've cut the surface. <clears throat> so now I'm going to take this piece. I'm going to take that cut. I'm going to look at it closely. That's my artist's impression of looking at it closely with an eyeball. And we're going to, we're going to rotate it so that we're looking at it flat in the plane of the page. So looking at it flat in the plane of the page, we would see z going up, z is going up, and what would be going to the right? x. <clears throat> are you saying y or are you saying why? Why is it going to be x instead of y? Because if it, it is, it's, it's like, it would be like putting a flashlight right here. This, this is my flashlight here. Okay, and shining a light. And this would, this red slice would cast a shadow onto this plane, right? And you'd see Z and X. And I'm taking it and rotating it to right here. Okay, so this, this is a flashlight. <laughs> okay, so if we were to do that, then you would see the following. So there's the edges, and then <clears throat> see some kind of thing like that. And then our point is, say, right here. And we'd see that. And notably, okay, I'd like for you to look at this picture, and now you can be comforted because ah, this is a this is a a scalar calculus, uh, a single variable function, isn't it? So looking at it like this, which means that okay, you could take this this uh, graph and this point, and I could ask you, please. On your diagram, please sketch the tangent line to this. So this has a tangent line. <clears throat> okay, and then at least on mine, it kind of looks like this. OK, 
Okay? So what we want to do is we want to find the slope. of this tangent line. So what that is, that would be saying that, okay, we're at our favorite point on the surface, and we're saying that we're not going to move at all in the y direction, we're only going to move in the x direction. And what is the slope of doing that? So what is the slope of this tangent line? And then we're going to hold y fixed, fixed. Well, how did we find the, in, in, in calculus one, when there was a single variable, how did you find the slope of a tangent line? Derivative. Derivative, right? So you had a whole definition for that. Uh, we've got a whole definition for this too. So specifically, it will be the limit of the slopes of secant lines. So it is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h comma y minus f of x y over h. So it's the limit <coughs> of that. So that looks just like the definition of derivative in this in the scalar calculus case, the single variable case. So when this exists, so when the limit exists, It is denoted as the partial of f with respect to x evaluated at x, y. So now, these are, okay. So now, in the single variable case, these are, these are d's. They're written with, as in the same D that you write in, in grade school, lowercase d. This also is a D. It, <laughs> we get some, no. <laughs> get some. This also is a D, but it's written sort of uh, calligraphic, right? It's just a, a fancy D. Just call it fancy D. However, um, you know, sil silliness aside, it is necessary for you to write it in this way. Okay, so then another way that this can be denoted is with f and then subscript x, x and y. So both of these notations are equivalent to each other. You can, you can use the one on the right all you want, or the one on the left. Okay, so it is denoted in this way, and it is called... the, so I'll put a parenthetical first, x partial. So you, depending on the context, you might not say first x partial. You might just say x partial. In the same way that you say the derivative or the first derivative, depending on, what, on the context. Okay, so this is the, the x partial. So what do you think I'm about to do next? The y partial. Okay. So now I'm going to do exactly this, except I'm going to do it quite rapidly. And, and I'm going to do it in the other direction. So, so also, we can draw the picture again.
and then choose our favorite point in the domain, bring it up to the function. And then instead of cutting with a plane parallel to x, instead of holding y fixed and cutting with a plane parallel to xz, we'll hold x fixed and cut with a plane parallel to yz. When we do that, we'll see something like this. So some kind of plane that looks like this. And now I'll take this slice out and write it plainly over here where it's plainer to see. So look at this closely. And then that's another calculus one function. And because it's a calculus one function, I can say, well, draw the tangent line. OK, there it is. The slope of that tangent line <coughs> is given by the limit as h goes to 0 of, so now I'm going to give you a moment to try and fill in the correct limit. What do you think? Uh, nearly, so it's f of x and then y plus h. Okay. I'm sure that's what you meant. That's what I meant. And then Absolutely. and then minus f of x and y okay. over h. And when this limit exists. <coughs> So when this exists, it is denoted as the partial of f with respect to y of x and y. And how else is it also denoted? f subscript y of x and y. And what's it called? Yes, it's called the first y partial. OK, so, <clears throat> so let's talk about the terminology for a minute. Why is it called, why is this, this one called the x partial? But, and, and not just that's what we defined it to be called, <laughs> right? Right. So, so when you're down here in the puddle, so I want you, what I want you to imagine is that I could grab this blue point and move it around, okay, and keep it in the puddle. And, and as I'm moving it around, this, the blue point up here would be moving around too. So what the what the x partial represents, it represents how z changes if you're only moving in the x direction. What the y partial represents is how z is changing if you're only moving in the y direction. So the reason why they're called partials is because they only give you part of the information. So they're called partials. OK. <clears throat> so. They're called partials because each one of them only gives you a part 
of the information and not all of it. <clears throat> so another matter and remark to make about this is that <clears throat> in calculus 1, if we were given a function f of x, it was reasonable and common to write f prime of x. What does that mean in, in the calculus 1 context? Derivative. It means derivative. Okay. So now, if we have a function f of x and y, then what would this mean? What does that mean? So first, first off, I'd like to point out that we haven't given it any meaning yet. Right? Nothing that we've written means anything. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead and say that this, if you were to write it, is just wrong. Just, just writing it is wrong. Right? Anything that you write after it will also be wrong. So what, what, what's, what's wrong with this? Because we don't know which, is the, which partial we're doing. There it is. Right? It's, it's an ambiguity. Right? So in calculus 1, it makes perfect sense to say, here's my function of a single variable, and this is the derivative. There is no other. But in calculus 2, or in just the case where we have a function of two variables, we don't have a way to say the derivative. So this has no meaning. Very good. So these are now replaced by two separate, by su by two separate um, things, these two. Okay, so these two, you you can, you could say, are the generalization of the prime notation from the single variable case. So you can use these now. Okay, <clears throat> further. If we were given f of x in calculus 1, then it was normal to talk about df dx evaluated at x. Okay. Now, this, this D, a regular D, let me, let me draw those very carefully so there's no room for confusion. It was normal to write this in Calculus 1. Now, in Calculus 2, that's not how we write. Uh, that's not how we write this. So if I give you f of x and y, then this statement is wrong. It's wrong. <clears throat> How do you write this statement correctly? With the weirdo D's, right? The fancy D's. <clears throat> okay. Okay, and you might um, wonder, well, why is why is that the case? So, <clears throat> the short answer, the short answer to that question, is that when you write a Latin D this Latin D, that signifies to the reader, and in your case, the greater, that you believe that this function f has exactly one variable. That's the meaning of Latin D in this context, exactly one variable. Uh, and that's obviously false. How many, how many variables is f a function of? Two. Two. So writing this b betrays a a an ignorance, essentially. 
writing this, the fancy D, is saying that, well, this is, this is some of the derivative information. Okay, so uh, to put this in maybe to a different analogy, if you like, did you have a question? Yes, so is it fancy D both over DX and DY? Is it the same as above that there's gonna be two, op two options? So on that on right. one, you're just showing one option, right. but is it the same as it is above where you can either do it with the, with the yeah. X or the Y? R correct. Okay. But the reason why I didn't do that is because this one is ambiguous. It could mean that one or that one. This one is, I would say, less ambiguous because right. it says X, okay. but it's wrong because it says D right. and not fancy D. So <laughs> to, put it, to put a different analogy, uh, I could make it by analogy to, in the, in the English language, we have something called number agreement in, in a sentence. Okay, so then when, when the object is singular, then the, uh, then the surrounding words get conjugated in a certain way, and when the object is plural, the surrounding words get conjugated in a different way. So, like I could say, um, this is my red pen. Okay, it's a single object. And then I could, so this is my red pen. So I could, I could hold all of these and say, these are my pens. So notice what changed is that now the, now the object is plural. Right? We're, we're speaking of these pens. And this became these. Okay? It's not, it, it, it is not correct to say, this are my red pens. So do you see the, the distinction? And is and are. So that's, that's called number agreement. Okay, th there's a similar thing going on in math. Okay, so this this fancy D is the number agreement with the number of variables. If you if you write this, if you write Latin D, then it sounds like you're saying, uh, "This are my fingers." Right? It sounds weird. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Good. So now let's. Um, <clears throat> do some examples of computing these. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so for example, if I was to give you f of x and y is 4x squared minus 9xy uh, plus 6y cubed. So the first request is please compute the partial of f with respect to x at x and y. So since this is the first, um, the first time, <clears throat> I'm going to do it right now instead of letting you do it. And I'm going to do it in excruciating detail. Okay, uh, but by the, by the end of even today's lecture, you, you won't do it in nearly even this much detail. Okay, so this is the partial with respect to x of 4x squared minus 9xy plus 6y cubed. Okay, so, that, so procedurally it looks just like doing derivative in calculus one. So this is called the partial derivative operator, just like ddx is the derivative operator. So the partial derivative distributes across the sum. So this would be partial with respect to x, 4x squared, and then minus partial with respect to x, 9xy, and then plus partial with respect to x, 6y cubed. So the derivative distributes, the partial distributes. So, how do you get the partial? so now, so like I said, excruciating detail, and now we're about to do it. Okay, yeah, that's another thing I should, I should mention, is that, is that you'll, you'll, you'll notice, 
Okay, so now I can comment about this. Uh, I myself, in particular, and many mathematicians generally write a two like this, which is a little bit more fancy than the general person writes a two. Okay, and the reason for that, most, most mathematicians writing two in this way, with a fancy, be, being sure to write the fancy serif for the two, is so that it is not confused with, with this one, okay, which has no foot, has no serif. Okay, so then, so that's how you can read what I'm writing, but, you know, it's, it's also a, a good idea for you to pay attention to, you're going to submit work like this to a grader, okay, and you should write it very clearly, because otherwise the grader may be angered or something. But can you do the other way as well? Yes, and I'm going to do, ex I'm going to alternate more or less between the various, between the two notations. notations. Okay. Okay, so then now, this means the limit as h goes to zero of blah, 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 which is exactly the same as computing an x derivative, a derivative with respect to x holding y fixed. So what is the derivative of 4x squared with respect to x holding y fixed? It's 8x. Okay, so that wasn't bad. Okay, now minus. So some of you will be able to get this the first try. Okay, some of you are gonna have a little more complication. So 9xy holding y fixed as a constant. Y is constant. What is the partial of 9xy with respect to x? 9xy. Okay, so I think I heard all possible combinations. 9y. It's 9y. Why is it 9y? So what I'm going to do to make it more clear to you, I hope, is I'm going to just move the y to the front because many students are accustomed to constants being in the front. Okay, so I'll move that to the front and just leave it there for a minute. Now that says 9y times x. What if that was 5x? What's the derivative of 5x? Five. What if it was 7x? Seven. What if it was pi x? Five. What do all those things have in common? Constant. That they're constant. So what is the derivative of 9y x? 9y. 9y. Okay. So now, what is the derivative of 6y cubed? 6y cubed. Y cubed. Zero. Why is the derivative? Oh, because there's no x. Oh. Yes. Y is a constant. Y is a constant. What is the derivative of a constant? Zero, even if it looks weirdish to you. Okay, that's a constant. No, I just I haven't done it. I just commuted it. Derivative. I like I like that. Good. Okay, so that'd be eight x and then minus nine y. <coughs> Good. Any questions about this? So this is a, you said in the beginning it was a limit thing, but you don't put the limit notation down? No, we're just going to do this just like anything else. It's just the derivative. If I was to ask you what's the derivative of x squared, you would tell me. Okay, so that's not a notation. Like that. that's like right. You would write 2x. You, you could, of course, use the limit definition. No, 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 no. I'm saying the limit notation, the limit as an h approaches 0, we don't add that to the no. So the, the only time you would do that is if I said, please compute a partial derivative using the limit definition. I think because this is equal to that. Yeah. Okay. Right. So how about part two? Please compute the y partial. Okay, so since this is the first one where I'm using this notation, I'll again do it in excruciating detail. Okay, so then 4x four, four squared minus 9xy plus 6y cubed. And then if this was calculus 1, I'd write a prime right here. 
Right? But we can't do that, right? Because this is calculus two, where we have multiple variables. So I'll write the y subscript here. So this y subscript means, at, at the end of this closing parentheses, means compute the y partial of everything enclosed. Okay, so then the y partial distributes to each term. So this would be 4x squared, the y partial of that, minus 9xy, the y partial of that, plus 6y cubed, the y partial of that. So just to, <coughs> is this the second step or? Second step. I, this, this is, no, this is, this We're is. Doing something entirely. Uh, something entirely different. This Got is it. the x partial, this is the y partial. Got it. So, using a different notation. Using the other notation. Using the other so what is the y partial of 4x squared? Zero. Zero. What is the y partial of 9xy? 9x. 9x. Oh, yes. What is the y partial of 6y cubed? 18y squared. Very good. So if we were going back and um, on that one it was 9xy, we're looking for the y partial, that would make it 18x, right? If it was like 9x squared, we would have to I'm not sure what you're asking, but we're going to do so many, I think I'll answer your question. Um, like this one? Is this what you're asking? So, for example, I know you said that 9y was a constant of x if we're looking for the partial derivative of x, right? Yes. So, nine y, yes, y is so constant with respect to x. So having said that, if the constant was 9y squared x, would that make it 18y? Or do we just leave it as 9y squared? If it's raised to a power, do you take yeah. the derivative Let, of Okay, yeah, yeah, so, okay. I'm going to I'm going to put that on hold for 10 seconds and ask are there any questions about what's written here? No. Okay. So now let yes. let's yes. Yes. Okay, what? How did you get 18y? Here? Because the the derivative with respect to y of 6y cubed, this 3 would come down to the front, be 18 and then subtract 1. So it would be 18y squared. So now for your, for your question, I think what you're asking is, what if it was the, the x partial of 9y squared x, and what if it was the y partial of 9y squared x? OK. So, so you answer then. No. No. Yes. What what if what if this what if I was covering up a five? What would so so just the top part. What if I was covering up a five, then what would the answer be? Five. Five, right? Because it would be the x derivative of five x is five. The x derivative of ten x is ten. The x derivative of pi x is pi. And what do all those have in common? They're, they're constant, right? It's constant times x. That's a constant. That's just like m. So what's, what's the x derivative? So we would leave it as 9y squared. 9y squared. That's a constant. Okay. For this one, for this one, in this, in this expression, what is constant? 9x. 9 and x are constant. So what is the derivative then? Not quite. So the, the 9 is a constant, so it will hang out. What's the y derivative of y squared? 2y. 2y. And, what it, and then x is just a constant, so it hangs out. So it would be 18yx. If that's disturbing to you, then... <laughs> Then I could rewrite this and say that this is the y partial. And I'll ask again, what all is constant in here? The 9 and the y. No, the 9 and the x. The 9 and the x. So I'll commute all of the constants to the front where, you're, where you are most a 
accustomed to seeing them. So now in here, what's constant? 9x. So what is the y partial? 9x times 2y. Which is this. <clears throat> Have I answered it? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other questions? <clears throat> so, uh, on that number two, is that the way you finish it? That's it? Right here, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you just ask for the partial? You didn't ask for anything. Right, I didn't ask for anything else. Just, just give me the partial. Okay, let's continue doing examples. I think it'll get more clear the, the more we do it. <clears throat> <laughs> Sorry? Is the answer one and two? Like, is the answer one and two? Like, for each of them, we need to do. No, so, uh, I, I asked a question. The, que the question in part one was this. That was the prompt. Oh. That was the prompt in part one. That was the prompt in part two. You're asking different questions. So, got it. Yes. <laughs> Where? This? Yes. This is a separate question entirely. Yes, I understand that. Okay. But I thought the y partial was a to the y. Where does the x come from at the end? A to the y? To the Here? Yes. Because x is a constant. So you can, if you like, you can commute all of the constants to the front so that it's 9x times y squared. You know, like, it's just a switch in our thought pattern. Right. So, so this red box is constant. Right? That red box is constant. So just ignore it if you can and just look at the red box. What, what is the y partial of y squared? It's 2y. What if this was, what if this was 8y squared? then it would be 8 times 2y, 16, right? What if this was pi, pi y squared? It would be pi times 2y. So, so this thing in red is just a constant with respect to x. We'll get it. You just got to rewire your brain. I know you're not accustomed to, to y being a constant and x being a constant, but we'll get it. Okay. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> for example, how about how about um, f of x and y is say three x plus four y to seven. And then we'll raise this to 8. <laughs> We're happy about this. OK, so then <clears throat> first question, how about please compute the partial of f with respect to y of x and y? So that means x is constant. That means x is constant. Good. <clears throat> So what's going to be necessary to do this? Chain the chain rule. That which is the opposite of substitution. <laughs> so, <laughs> so don't worry, we'll start doing the, the antiderivative again. Oh, awesome. It's coming. Okay, so we'll need the <laughs> Don't worry, you'll get accustomed to this. So this is the y partial of 3x plus 4y to 7 to 8. So yes, the, the pattern that we're going to use is that, yes, the y partial this looks like 
the y partial of u to 8. So the answer will be 8 u to 7, and then we'll have to multiply by the y partial of u for the chain rule. <clears throat> so that's the pattern. So that'd be 8, and then 3x plus 4y to 7 to 7, and then multiplied by the y partial of 3x plus 4y to 7. Okay, so then that first bit is finished, so I'll just copy it. So what remains to be done? Okay. What is the what is that y partial then? To six. Because the y partial of three x, the y partial of three x is zero. Okay, any question about this one? Okay, now please do the x partial. And do it in what, whatever notation you like, but I'm going to use the subscript notation. So it would be the same at the end, just do times. Yeah, essentially, yeah. <clears throat> So that would be three x plus four y to seven to eight, and then the x partial of this. <clears throat> so that would be eight, and then three x plus four y to seven to seven multiplied by 3x plus 4y to 7x partial. And then the x partial of the thing enclosed, 8, 3x plus 4y to 7 to 7. And then what is the x partial of that? 3. Right. It is constant with respect to x, so its partial with respect to x is 0. <clears throat> and could you move 3? Can you combine the 3 and the 8? Yeah, if you felt inclined to do so. But you don't I like to not. Yeah, if we don't have to, it's a little overkill. Okay. Any question about this? That's what I start trying to. <laughs> okay. How about <clears throat> how about um, let's change up, make the letters different. How about uh, H of A and B is A squared multiplied by exponential of four A minus three B. And I'm just no. I'm just doing this so you don't get too accustomed to x's and y's. <laughs> <laughs> so please find the a partial.
So what do you suppose I'm trying to bring out that I'm trying to test on this exercise? What do you think? Our knowledge. <laughs> okay, I agree. Can you be more specific? Our understanding of it. Okay. So let me say it like this. The, the previous exercise, the teaching point of view, from a teaching point of view, the purpose of the previous exercise was to test your usage of the chain rule. That was the purpose of the previous exercise. So we're doing that with the product. And so on this exercise, the purpose is to test the product rule. <clears throat> Sorry? Without the E? Can, oh, can I test such things without, the, without E? Well, not really. And the answer is, the, the reason why not is because if it was another polynomial, then you could just algebraically combine them. And then you wouldn't have to use the product rule. <laughs> what sounds bad about that? Like, okay. Really? <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah, get, getting to business. So, the A partial of this product. We'll need to use, <laughs> we'll, yeah, we'll need to use the product rule. So that's the a partial of a squared multiplied by exponential 4a minus 3b plus a squared multiplied by the a partial of exponential 4a minus 3b. Any question about how the product rule occurred there. Okay. So then that would be, what's the a partial of a squared? 2a. So that'd be 2a exponential 4a minus 3b and then plus a squared. Then what is the a partial of the exponential? B. 4a minus 3b. Yes. 4a minus 3b, and then what else? Okay, good, except I'm going to write multiplied by the partial of 4a minus 3b for the chain rule. And then evaluating this last partial, you get what? 4. Good. So then 2a exponential. 4a minus 3b <coughs> plus a squared exponential 4a minus 3b times 4. <coughs> Any question about this one? Okay, so how about did you have a question? Oh, we're going too. I'm going too fast. Okay. <clears throat> so this is okay. Okay. So then, what's the other thing I'm going to ask? The B partial, right? So will we need the product rule? Yes. No. No. No, right? Because the first factor, A squared, is constant. It's a constant with respect to b. So it would be like it would be like if I was to ask, "What's the derivative of of five x?" And you said, "Well, it, it would be the derivative of five multiplied by x plus five multiplied by the derivative of x." You could use you you could use the product rule to compute the derivative of five x. 
but it's just much shorter not to do that. So to be clear, this is the B partial of this thing, A squared exponential 4A minus 3B. And then all of the constant things can commute outside of the derivative. So this would be A squared and then partial of the exponential part. So that that's A squared. The exponential thing reappears. And then multiply by the B partial of the argument. And then what is the B partial of the argument? Negative, Negative 3. question about this one yes and so for every rule that you knew from scalar calculus calculus of functions of a single variable you now know the corresponding rule for partial derivatives right? there's a quotient rule okay, it works just like just like the other one except now you need to hold certain things constant when you do it Yes? Yes? Is there a preferred notation method by, by mathematicians? Do they have one that they can use more than the other? Do they use the Greek lettering or the subscript form? Um, probably among mathematicians, this one is, this one is in much more frequent use. Okay. And the yeah, subscript I mean, notation is in much more frequent use in the physical sciences. Okay. What's, that? What's that actually called? This letter? Uh, uh, a calligraphic D, a calligraphy D. <clears throat> Other questions? Okay. <clears throat> so now let's do, let's mix in some further tasks with the partials. So how about uh, if I was to give you function of x and y is 2x squared plus 9xy cubed. So 2x squared plus 9xy cubed plus 8y plus 5. Okay, so first request, please find the slope of the tangent line in the y direction at the point negative 1, 2. So, so the slope of the tangent line in the y direction, that's a mouthful, right? If only we had a, a shorter way to say that. The y partial. The y partial, right? So to say this in, a diff in different language, it's, it's saying 
evaluate the y partial at one at negative one two. So evaluate the y partial. Okay. So we'll need to compute the y partial. So by now, I, I hope and suspect that you could probably just read it out one line and just tell me, what is the y partial? 27x squared plus 8. Thank you. Okay, that's the y partial. So by now, I think you should probably be able to do that, right? So this has no y's. It's a constant. Its y partial is 0. That's 5. Its y partial is 0. Y partial of 8y is 8. Y partial of this thing is 9x times 3y squared, which is that. So what's being asked is, now just plug in these values. So the y partial at negative 1, 2 is, so that'd be negative 27 multiplied by 4 and then plus 8, so that's negative 108 plus 8 is negative 100. Did you have that written down somewhere else? Did you like just do that in your head? I just did that in my head. Because this is four 25s. It just freaked me out for a second. I used to calculate it for like basic math. Okay, good. Very good. <laughs> so now, now uh, the slope of the tangent line uh, at negative 1, 2 in the x direction. What do you think? 4x plus 9y. Okay, good. So does, does everyone agree that what's being requested is find the x partial and then evaluate it at that point? Okay. So you should be able to read off the x partial just one line. What is it? 4x, 4x plus 9y cubed. Plus 9y cubed. Okay, and then <clears throat> evaluate this at negative 1, 2. So that'd be negative 4 plus 9 times 8 is 72, so 68. <clears throat> Any question about this one? Okay, so now here's a fun one. Find. where both partials are zero. So we want them both to be zero at the same time. So set them equal to No. No. You don't set them equal to each other. That would mean that they're the same. That could mean that they're both seven. So we need them both to be not just equal to each other, but both equal to zero. <clears throat> so <laughs> while <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that means that we need to solve the following system of equations. We need to solve uh, 4x plus 9y cubed is equal to 0 and 27xy squared plus 8 is equal to 0. So we're going to solve this nonlinear system of equations. 
So while you dread that for a minute, I'm going to remind you and say, well, what if we were in the scalar calculus case, in the, in the case where we had a function of a single variable, and we had just the derivative, because, and we say the because there is no other, and I asked you to solve where the derivative is zero. So where all of the derivatives are zero, right? Because <laughs> there's just one of them. What is that called? What do we call places? What is the analytic, what is the analytic name for a place where the derivative is zero in a stationary, a stationary point? What is the geometric name? A horizontal tangent line. What, we're not saying it yet, but that's just because it just hasn't come up yet. But what is this going to be? A place where both partials are zero. It's, go it's going to be a stationary point. What's going to be the analytic name for it? I just said it. It's, it's, going, it's going to be a stationary point, and what's going to be the geometric name for it? A tangent plane. A, tang a horizontal tangent plane. Yeah. That's what we're asking. That's what's being asked. It's not what's being said, but in the end, that's what's going to happen. So we want to solve this. Okay. So solving nonlinear systems of equations is a painful process. Uh, so let's just get on with it. <clears throat> so the first thing that we'll do is we'll take, take either equation, take either one, and solve for one variable. So that means take either one and solve for x or solve for y. And you should, do, you should choose whichever equation and whichever variable is most expedient. So for my money, I think the first one is easiest because the variables are already separated. So I'll take 4x plus 9y cubed is 0. and I'll solve for x. So then 4x is negative 9y cubed. So x is negative 9y cubed over 4. So now what? Yes. Now plug this one into the other equation. <clears throat> There's no good choice. So now plug this into the other equation. <clears throat> so the other equation was 27xy squared plus 8 <clears throat> equal to 0. And we're going to take this. in height and plug it into this. Take that and plug it in there. <clears throat> so that would be 27 multiplied by negative 9y cubed over 4 y squared plus 8 is equal to 0. <clears throat> Okay, a little bit of simplification. 27 times 9 is? Yes. So negative 243 over 4. And then y cubed times y squared is? Y to 5th plus 8. And, you know, you might complain and say, I don't know, this is not looking good. Uh, how <laughs> however, we have achieved something. What have we achieved? Just one variable. There's just one variable now. Which is good, because it's easier to solve a function, uh, an equation of one variable. So let's solve for y. So uh, I guess I'll move <coughs> this negative term to the other side. 
get 8. 243 over 4y to 5. Now what? Right, so in, instead of dividing, I'll do what? Multiply by, Multiply by its reciprocal. So that would be um, that would be 8 multiplied by 4 over 243 is y to 5. So that would be 32 over 243 is y to 5. So now what? Yes. Uh -huh. OK. <laughs> So yes, fifth root of 32 over 243 is y. <clears throat> and then, just so you know, we don't invoke any magical calculator arguments. That's the way the radical uh, distributes. What is the fifth root of 32? Two. That's <laughs> that. So that should be no no knowledge, right? Like everybody here is a 32-bit computer and all of that. Why why 32? Is it someone just said no, not 31, 33? That'd be too much. You know what? No, 30 32 because that's a power of two, right? And then what is the fifth root of 243? Three. Three. So that'd be two thirds is y. So is that the answer to the question? No, because every time I say that, the answer is no. So why is that not the answer to the question? It's the same step one. We, need to solve for x. we need to find x, right? It says, find where both partials are 0. So we need a point. Now, just, just to be clear about this, we, wanna, we want a point in, in the... So this is x, and this is y, and this is z. So a point is a single position down here on x, y. That's what a point is. What is y as 2 thirds? It's that whole line, right? It's a line. It's, it's y as 2 thirds for any, for any x. Okay, so y as 2 thirds all by itself looks like this. So that's not, that can't be the answer to the question. So how do we figure out what x is? Plug the y back in. Yes. So we could take one of the equations from above. So how about that one that, ha that we've already solved for x and then plug in our value of y? <clears throat> so that equation is x is equal to negative 9y cubed <coughs> over 4. And then I'm going to take <clears throat> this y and plug it in there. <clears throat> so x is negative 9 times 2 thirds cubed over 4. OK, so then x is. <clears throat> x is what? It's negative 9 multiplied by 8 over 27 over 4. So it'll be negative. And then 9 over 27 is a third. 8 over 4 is 2. So that's 2 thirds. So negative 2 thirds. So what is the answer to the question? Very good. So this function has just one place where both partials are 0. So just this one. <clears throat> Any question about this one? Solving nonlinear equations, systems of nonlinear equations, is just this terrible. It just doesn't get, it doesn't get any better. <laughs>
except when you use a machine, because then you can, you can find approximations to nonlinear systems of equations quite, quite rapidly with machines. But doing it by hand is yucky. <clears throat> okay, so we've talked about partial derivatives. We've talked about partial derivatives, and if you remember, so we're going to proceed by analogy to what you did in Calculus 1. So can you think back to Calculus 1? You, you went over secant lines and tangent lines and said, oh, derivative, and then you went over all these rules. What's the very next thing you started doing? Do you remember? No? Well, okay, I agree. You can talk about second derivatives. Okay, but we talked about that. We talked about second part. Oh, no, we haven't. Okay, that's, okay, that's the next thing. That's the problem. Thank you. <clears throat> Good. So, so, he, so he was right. Oh, oh, in the book? Okay. <laughs> Good. So, uh, just, like, just like in calculus uh, one, where you have first derivative and second derivative, you have first partials and second partials. Okay, so then, so, definition. So given f of x and y, then we can compute um, second partials. So the first one I'll write is f sub xx. That means the x partial of the x partial. So specifically what it means, so another way to write it is partial squared of f over partial x squared of x and y. And what it means is it, it means the x partial of the x partial of f of x and y. Okay, so the x partial of the x partial. Okay, what's another second partial? Y, y. Okay. So y, y. So that is that is written partial squared f over partial y squared of x and y is the partial with respect to y of the partial with respect to y of f of x and y. Are there any others? Ah, there's, there's f, x, y. So first one, then the other. So I have a question here. <clears throat> so the first two were sort of unambiguous, right? This, this first one is saying the x partial of the x partial. And this one is saying the y partial of the y partial. What is this one? The x partial of the y partial. Opposite, the y partial of the x partial. The y partial of the x partial. So is there an x, y, x? There is. So <clears throat> this. This is the one that occurs first. So that means, at, and this one occurs second. We're going to get to that in a second. So this means the y partial of the x partial. So the order that they occur in is that whichever one is closest to f, that's, that's the one that has to occur first. Okay, so then this is written, this in the other notation is written as partial squared f of what in the, in the denominator? 
other way, partial y, partial x. So what notable thing has occurred here? Yeah, they're, they're in the other order in this notation. And the reason for that is that when you, when you write this out, it means the y partial of the x partial of f of x and y. So which one occurs first? The x. The x. x occurs first. And notice that, that x is the one closer to f. x is the one closer to f. Okay, so in, in this notation, the subscript notation, the partials are evaluated in the order left to right. But in this notation, the partials are evaluated in, in the order right to left. Okay, and whatever the case is, it's always, you always start with the one that's closest to f. <clears throat> so is there another one? Yes. Yes. So there's f, y, x. And so now I think you get the idea, so I'll just write the rest of it quickly. So partial squared and then partial x, partial y, uh, evaluated at x and y. So that's partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, f of x and y. So I'd like to point out maybe something that is interesting, and that is that, well, in calculus one, when you had a function of a single variable, there was one derivative and there was one second derivative. Just the one, back in the good old days when functions just had one variable. So here, in this case, how many first partials are there? Two. Two. And how many second partials are there? Four. Four, right? Things start getting interesting quickly. Um, <clears throat> so one comment about this, so th this is the definition of second partials. Ah, but I do need to make one other comment. So these two are referred to as mixed partials because there's, there is an x partial and also a y partial, and these other two are unmixed because this is xx and this is yy. I'm sorry? I'm asking how would you, if you were going to verbalize it, how would you know how to differentiate between the two different mixed um, partials? Like Th this one is called like f, x, x, y. Oh, okay. And this one is called f, f y, x. <clears throat> uh, so, now, if <clears throat> f, x, y, and f, y, x are both continuous, then, in fact, f, x, y evaluated at x, y is equal to f, y, x evaluated at x, y. <clears throat> So this proposition is so important to mathematicians anyway that it has a name. It's called Clairaut's theorem. That's not really important to know in this class because uh, we're not going to prove it anyway. But <coughs> uh, math majors have to prove it before they can go on and do their thing. Uh, what this means to, to a mathematician, this means that this is essentially never true. Right? It's only true in very special cases that the, that the mixed partials are the same. However, in this class, it means that because this is, this is 
you know, applied calculus too. It means that this is always true, <laughs> is what it actually means. So in math in math thirteen twenty six the mixed partials are always equal. However, do understand if you, you know, if you get it, if you get it in your mind that, you know what, I'm going to be a math major. <laughs> the, <laughs> a, a guy can dream, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you, there's, there's lots and lots of functions where the mixed partials are not equal. Okay, but in this class, it's, they're essentially all equal. Okay, <clears throat> so let's have some uh, examples of this. It can happen, you know. Those are calculus two students. Yeah, it can happen. So what if I give you f of x and y uh, is negative 4x cubed minus 3x squared y cubed plus 2y squared. Okay, and I ask, please uh, evaluate, <clears throat> please find all second partials. And verify the mixed partials are equal. Of course. <laughs> so how many partials, to, to answer this exercise, how many partials will you have to evaluate? Four. More than that? Six. 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 Why six? <laughs> yes. The two first partials, the four second partials. <laughs> Did you see me do that? Did you see that? <laughs> I tried to hold up four, and then I had my thumb out, and I... <laughs> six. So, six partials. <clears throat> Don't worry, it'll get better. We're going to start doing... This is... This isn't even... This isn't even calculus, really. I mean, wow. in my wow. yet. I mean, we're just doing this really boring. This is like some of the hardest stuff we're doing, and we're doing great. Y'all are doing great. Okay, so the x partial. So these these really should all be one-liners. I think. I think you're comfortable with it enough. So what's the x partial? Negative twelve x squared minus. Very good. No, y cubed, right? Oh, yeah, I just wrote it incorrectly. I do that. Okay, the y partial. Oh, that's not the way I did it. I did, I did down to the second row first. Oh, okay. So I'm going to do, do both first ones. So the y partial. Negative 9x squared y squared. And then plus 4y. So those are the first partials. So the second partials now. I'll do the unmixed ones first. So that means this xx means x partial of x partial. So what is it? The negative 24x. Very good. Minus 6y cubed. 
Okay, then yy, that means y partial of y partial. So that's negative. Okay, good. And now wait a minute, I thought these were supposed to be equal. No, no, that's the mixed. Oh, the mixed ones are equal, okay. <laughs> oh, really? Because <laughs> you need a <laughs> Okay, so then x, y. What, do, what does that mean now? So we get the very first one and then find y. Mm -hmm. Right. It means, it means the y partial of the x partial. So I'm, I'm going to wait and make sure everyone's caught up. So negative 18 y squared. Everyone? So xy means you take the x partial that you computed above and you compute the y partial of that. Then, you, just, then you've made an error. I probably have. <laughs> we'll just skip this place. So this is uh, oh, yes. what? Negative. That's what I do. Eighteen <laughs> x y squared. But it's a good check, right? Damn. So if I if you if you have an exercise and it says find all second partials, even though you know from Clairaut's theorem that you can sort of get away with just doing three of them instead of four of them, I should do them all. You should go ahead and do them all. <laughs> because if you go ahead and do them all, then that serves as a check. Like, okay, well. Good. So that's that. So now fyx, what does that mean that we need to do? Right. Compute the, take the y partial and then compute the x partial of that. So the y partial is this. Let's compute the x partial of it. So that'd be negative 18xy squared. <clears throat> what does this do? OK, so let's answer that. So now, when I was, I had totally, when we, I first did this, I had totally forgotten about second partials. So now I'm going to say the exact same thing that I said again, is that in, in the course of going through calculus one, after you talked about first and second derivatives, what was the next thing you did? Extrema. Extrema. OK. So in calculus one, when you had just functions of a single variable, back when functions just had single variables, back in, back in the day, yeah, when life was good. <laughs> we had this kind of deal. So we had, we sort of cut apart functions and we tried to find parts that look like this or like this. How did we find parts of functions that look like this or this? What, what, do, what do these two points have in common? Extreme. Well, yes, but if we, if we were doing it analytically, what do these have in common? Slope is zero, okay, and that's called a stationary point. So in both cases, in both cases, the derivative is zero here. So the derivative uh, at if this is point C is zero for that one, and the derivative at C is zero for that one. So derivative being zero is not enough for you to distinguish between these two. Right? So how do you distinguish between these two in calculus one? Make a sign chart. You could make a you could make a slope chart. A slope chart. But what if what if you weren't gonna do that? There's another way. The second derivative test, right? So this kind of thing, if I put some googly eyes on it, right? Oh, it's a sad, a sad function. So what must be true here? It's the min. 
It's a, it's a max. Oh, it's a max. I'm sorry. It's a max. So, what must be true about the second derivative here? Oh, it's negative? Yes, the second derivative is negative here. So, if you can find a place where the first derivative is zero and the second derivative is negative, then that is a maximizer. If you can find a place where the first derivative is zero and what must be true about the second derivative here? positive, then what have you found? A, min. a minimizer. <laughs> okay. So this, this little corner of the page, you know, is like, you know, something like 20% of calculus one, right? We just put it all in that box right there. Okay. So then <clears throat> now in where we are now, the thing we just did is we want to take pieces of surfaces and we want to classify them. So this was taking pieces of, of, of plots of, of calculus one functions and classifying them. Now we're going to take pieces of surfaces and classify them. And now it's going to look like this. So here at the top, this one is going to be a maximizer, a maximizer. So you can see that it's a maximizer just because I drew a picture, right? But what I'd like to point out is what is going to be true, what is going to be true about the tangent, what, let me ask it like this. This is a tangent line. Okay, what kind of thing is tangent to this surface? A plane, right? So there's a tangent plane. And what must be true about this tangent plane? It's going to be horizontal. So there's a horizontal tangent plane there. Okay. And how about down here? What's going to be true about the tangent plane down here? Also horizontal. So horizontal tangent plane is not enough to distinguish between maximizer and minimizer. Just like horizontal tangent line is not enough to distinguish between maximizer and minimizer. But there's even a third case that can occur on surfaces, and it's called a saddle. Okay, so then again we have a, we have a tangent plane that's horizontal. horizontal tangent plane. So now, the, w the place where the second derivative information comes in is I'd like for you to consider. Suppose we take this, suppose we take this um, little bubble and we cut it with a vertical plane. Notice that along that cut uh, with a vertical plane, it would look like this one if you just follow that cut, so like this. So we cut it. And it looks like, just like this one. And no, no matter how I turn my cutting plane, it'll always be pointing down. Okay? It'll be like this one. So that's how we're going to tell that this one is a maximizer. That's how we're going to analytically tell it's a maximizer. Notice the same thing is true, uh, the, the opposite thing is true for this one. If you take this one and cut it with a vertical plane, then you'll always see this kind of thing. But what about this one? What about this one? I think it has both. It has both. Yeah. Because if you cut it with this plane, you see that thing that opens up, but if you cut it in the other direction, it has a different one that opens down. OK? 
Okay? So then, again, a saddle, right? Or a mountain pass. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the first derivative to locate these horizontal tangent planes. We're going to be able to say, okay, let's find where the horizontal tangent planes are. Okay, we found them. And then we're going to use the second derivative to determine, okay, that place where we found a horizontal tangent plane, is it a maximizer? Is it a minimizer? Or is it a saddle? So that's, that's the answer to your question. What are we going to do with this? Then you might say, okay, well, that's what we're going to do with this in calculus, <laughs> in this class. What is this done in real life? Okay, so in real life, all of the time, people are interested in maximizing or minimizing something. Okay, example would be something like, uh, you know, you want to maximize profit or minimize cost or maximize revenue or whatever. So there's plenty of places where you find a, a stationary point where the stationary point is a saddle. Um, <clears throat> what's a good, I can't think of a money example of a saddle point off the top of my head. But there's plenty of physical examples of saddle points. Uh, an example would be some kind of physical system that is unstable, like um, balancing a broomstick on your hand. Right, so you can do it, it can be done, but um, if the broomstick falls too far, it's going to fall all the way down. So that's like saying that you want to keep the point right here, but if it starts falling off the edge, then it'll fall all the way down. Okay. So these kind of things are, are all the time important in physical sciences. Did you have a question? Right. Yes. So you want to you want to maximize anything. So, like if you have revenue, you have marginal revenue. <coughs> Wiki did. Good. Okay. So we need uh, definitions for all these these things. So now we're in section nine three. which is called something like extrema. So a definition. So if we have a picture here, Just drawing a function. So far, it's pretty boring looking. It's just a flat plane. So now I need to make it more interesting so we have something to say. <clears throat> so this is supposed to be like a, like a, okay, a, a vortex. <laughs> Okay, so it's like a it's like a sheet, and someone pushed a little bump in it. So at the bottom of this bump would be a minimizer. So there's a minimizer that occurs there, <clears throat> and then over here, someone did the opposite thing. up and so there's a maximizer here. So we want to be able to say what does it mean what does it mean to have found these? Okay. So we're going to take this point and we're going to go down to the domain and find it right there. That's supposed to go straight down. And then we'll cut this. 
and this in turn comes down to a circle in the domain. <clears throat> okay, and now, now that we've cut away just this piece, I'm going to zoom in on it, look very closely at it, just that piece. <clears throat> And what you see is something that looks like this. <laughs> I zoomed in and I drew it exactly the same size. Let me draw it a little bigger. So this is the point in question, and this is some little cut of the domain. So the reason why this we're going to call this a maximizer is because, notice, in this circle at least, not anywhere possibly, but in this circle, if we select another point, say like that point, and take it up to the surface, then this point is lower than the red point. And no matter where I put the green point, the height of the green, the green point down here, the height of the green point up here is always going to be less or equal to the height of the red point. So that's what it means to be a local maximum. So f of x naught, y naught, greater or equal to f of x, y for all x, y in the circle uh, says that x naught, y naught is a local maximum. So, <clears throat> yes. So, I could take the picture and make one more modification. And then I could say, okay, now this, that's the highest point of them all. That one. Now, is this a this nevertheless is a local maximum because, because I can cut away this piece, just this piece. So I'll grab it and magnify it and put it over here. So that point, these points are in correspondence with each other. So this point is a local maximum because in this local neighborhood, that is the highest point. So as long as you're in this neighborhood, there's no point higher than that one. Now, this isn't the global maximum, because you can see over here there's an even bigger maximum. But it is a local maximum. Okay, then I can turn the picture upside down and I could say minimum. Right? Local minimum means that it's a point that's lower than all of the neighboring points. Okay, so what we want to be able to find is we want to be able to use calculus to find, like for example, on this particular function, there are three interesting points, the three red points. So we need a way to find them analytically, that is to say by writing equations and things like that. So this is the definition of a stationary point. So uh, point AB 
is called a stationary point. of f of x and y when the x partial at a, b is equal to the y partial at a, b is equal to 0. So several pages ago and minutes ago, I asked a question. This was it. So what is a more succinct, succinct way to say this? Find the stationary points of F. Okay. So <clears throat> find the stationary points of F. Notice that's what we did on this exercise. We said, okay, in the end we said that negative two-thirds comma two-thirds is a stationary point of F. Did we make any conclusion about it being a minimum, a maximum, or a saddle point or anything? No. No. We didn't make, we didn't attempt any conclusion whatsoever. Okay. So, stationary point. So, to make this uh, clear, it are, it's places where there's a horizontal tangent plane. So now I'm going to ask a question. I want you to minimize, minimize f of x and y is x squared plus y squared minus 2x minus 4y plus 8. So this is, this is really bad because presently, presently you have no calculus techniques to do this. So you don't have any techniques to do this. All that you have is, all that you have is algebra. So we're going to have to answer this question algebraically. Well, how do, you, how do you answer this question algebraically? How do you do it? So you might remember from college algebra you had a technique called complete the square. <laughs> and so, because there's two variables, we're going to do it twice. Right? Completing the square once was... was fun enough, but twice would be even better. So I'm going to do this very quickly to remind you that it's a thing. So x squared minus 2x, so we collect the x's together, plus y squared minus 4y, collect the y's together, and then 8, you don't have either, so you have to play by yourself. So now inside of here, we're going, to we're going to complete the square for each variable. So that's x squared minus 2x. And completing the square is you sort of do this magical add and subtract thing. So we'll take half of negative 2, which is negative 1, square that, add it, and then subtract that much. And do the same with the y's. This number, you take half and then square. So half of negative 2 is negative 1 squared is 1. Add and subtract. Half of negative 4 is negative 2 squared is 4. So we're going to add 4. 
and subtract 4. With degree 1, yeah. So now these three terms and these three Wait, terms. We're almost out of time. So the punch, it'll make more sense when we get to the punchline. So what are these, these three terms are a square. How can they be written as a square, these three terms? X squared minus, uh, X squared minus one squared. No, no I'm X sorry, minus X minus one, one squared. X minus one squared. Good, X minus one squared minus one plus, how about these three? Yeah, y minus 2 squared, and then minus 4 here, and then plus 8. Now collecting everything, this would be x minus 1 squared plus y minus 2 squared minus 1 minus 4 plus 8 is plus 3. So now, what's the smallest this term can ever be? It, it is smallest at 1, but what is, this, what is the smallest it can ever be? Zero. Zero. It can't get any smaller because it's something squared. How about this one? Zero. How about this one? What's the smallest that can be? Three. three. So the smallest this, can, this function can ever be is 3. And where does that occur? When x is? Zero. When x is? One. 1. And y is? Two. So at the point one two, at the point one two, the function is minimized with value three. The reason why is because this function looks like this. So x is one, y is two, z is three. So at that point right there. is the bottom of a is the bottom of a parabolic surface. And so the good news is is that I'm never going to ask you to do this. Beca because on Thursday we're going to see how to do this with science. Right? And, science. Uh, and not algebra. 